you may be wondering what a public health doctor is doing thinking and talking about artificial intelligence. It seems to be worlds away from what my day job is. And in actual fact, that's true. My day job is as the clinical lead for contact tracing, which doesn't use artificial intelligence whatsoever. But as a public health doctor, my interest in artificial intelligence is mostly in the future promise, right? In the UK alone, we believe that about 1,000 people die every month because of mistakes made by doctors. Now, I'll put in the caveat that those same doctors save hundreds of thousands of people, so this isn't a slight on them, but the fact of the matter is doctors get tired, they work long hours, they work through the nights at some times, there's handovers, there's all sorts of opportunities for mistakes. Mistakes do get made, and that translates into morbidity and mortality. It's also true that in low- and middle-income countries, there's a massive shortfall in terms of the number of available healthcare workers, doctors, clinicians, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, is there an opportunity to offload some of that cognitive burden from doctors, from people, onto computers? And of course, the short answer, if you want to know the sort of conclusion, the bottom line of the whole talk is, of course, yes, there is. There's all sorts of interesting opportunities, but we need to think about the path. How do we get from where we are now? How do we take technology that we know works? How do we take technology that we know will work and apply that in a clinical setting? So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and I'm going to be quite brief. I'm going to answer the question briefly, what is AI? My definition might be a little bit at odds with what you might get from a data scientist, but that's just because I've got a way of thinking about this. To my mind, AI is whenever you use a machine or a computer to replicate an aspect of the human brain or the human mind. In other words, people are good at following instructions. Computers can do that. People are good at recognizing things and phenomenon, right? Computers can do that. People are good at following a sequence of instructions or making a sequence of decisions against a stated or predetermined uh, determined objective. And we know that computers can do that, and I'll talk a little bit about in what context. And then finally, there's an aspect of the human mind, consciousness, our ability to determine our own objectives. And of course, we do not have that in the computer world yet, but I'm told by people that are close to the subject matter that that's in the pipeline. I heard an interesting quote. Someone said, um, they're not afraid of the first AI that can pass the Turing test. Uh, they are afraid of the first AI that pretends not to. And so that's just a little... Uh, kind of reminder that we can go and sell our bitcoins and buy canned goods, which might be a better currency in a post uh, AGI apocalyptic world, but I'm being facetious, of course, uh, or maybe not. Um, but nev nevertheless, there's opportunities for AI to be used in the context of healthcare, and I want to talk a little bit about where those opportunities are. The first kind of machine learning that has got an obvious application in the, in the world of AI, and let's see if I can get the next slide to come up. I can't but that doesn't matter. I know what the next slide looks like. The first opportunity is what we call supervised learning. Here we go. Supervised learning is solving what machine, uh, what data scientists call the cat, not cat problem. Can you get a computer to recognize a picture that has a cat in it? And the short answer is yes, and I'll explain how it works. Basically, and I'm gonna give you the 30 second version of what, uh, uh, what, what an, uh, an, uh, an artificial neural network does. You have what's called training data, these are pictures of, in this case, cats and not cats, and these pictures are labeled. In other words, we know what the truth is about the picture, whether or not it has a cat. Right, this gets converted into digital numbers and gets fed in to an artificial neural network. Now, the nice thing about an artificial neural network is it is exactly what it sounds like it is. It's like a brain. There's lots of little nodes, and it's an interconnected mesh. In comes what we call the input vector, this, this digital version of our cat, not cat problem, and out pops an output vector, which is the, the artificial neural network's best guess as to whether or not there's a cat in the picture. That output vector gets compared to the original label, the ground truth, was there or wasn't there a cat? And the difference between the two is what we call an error signal. Right, so now the artificial neural network knows how badly it got that question wrong. It makes an adjustment to the configuration of the network and tries again and sees if it can decrease that error signal. It does it again and again and again, millions of times until the error signal is just about zero, at which point you can take away the training data and feed it any picture, and it will tell you with almost 100% accuracy whether or not there's a cat in that picture. Okay, stop watching the video. Stop watching the video. I want to give a quick big thank you to Nested Knowledge for supporting the creation of this video. 
If you've ever gone through the struggle of doing a literature review or a systematic literature review, believe me, I know your pain. I've been there and what I'm about to tell you is gonna absolutely blow your mind. Nested Knowledge have a platform that supports the entire process from designing your research question and search parameters to screening, tagging, and extracting the appropriate papers. The platform automatically generates visuals that you can use for qualitative analysis. So check out these interactive sunburst diagrams used to get an overview of trial endpoints, or, and this is gonna blow your mind, it can extract study results to do meta-analysis. So check out these ready for publication forest plots. And this next amazing feature is gonna become, I believe, the new standard for systematic review. It's being able to publish a living document that auto updates as more data becomes available. Okay, now things are gonna get really crazy. If you're working or studying in an academic institution, then this platform is absolutely free for you. So check them out by clicking on the link in the description below. Okay, let's get on with the video. The application in healthcare is of course obvious. We've got radiology, we've got ophthalmology, we've got pathology, microbiology, almost any cl clinical discipline in which a human being looks at a picture of some description and makes a clinical decision, that can be offloaded and done by a computer and in many cases, much, much better than the human. So it, there's, there's obvious applications for supervised learning. The other kind of machine learning for which there are, I think, going to be interesting applications in the healthcare setting is what we call reinforcement learning. So we learn behavior as children by getting rewards and punishments, right? And that's how we teach an AI to drive a car. These are sequential decisions against a stated objective. The car, the AI, drives, and if it gets something wrong, it gets a punishment. Drives into a tree, minus 10 points. Goes in the right direction, plus two points, right? The AI is then told to maximize its reward function. And again, through iteration after iteration, it learns to drive the car perfectly from point A to point B 100% of the time, or nearly 100% of the time. So this is what we call reinforcement learning, and the application in healthcare, I believe, is going to be in, for example, in an ICU, where you've got a patient who needs sequential decisions made based off real-time data that's coming with respect to bloods or oxygen levels or hydration, et cetera, et cetera, and adjustments to the medication and to the fluids and to the oxygen levels given to the patient can be made in real time. Now, we're not seeing that application right now, but I think that it's definitely in the future and that it'll be exciting. The question is, right, we've got this exciting technology. How do we translate that technology into real clinical settings? And it is being done, but it's not being done at the sort of scale that one might expect, given the state of the art technology that's out there. Like we're seeing artificial intelligence being used in banking and in climate uh, predictions, et cetera, et cetera. But it's been used to a lesser extent in health. And the reason for that is health data is a little bit sticky. You need consent to use people's personal health data, for example. The gatekeepers will always be clinicians. And clinicians are a very interesting animal. And actually, we can probably go to the next slide. And then that's the reinforcement learning. And we'll, go to the, we'll just skip past that. It's a nice little picture. Imagine the car being navigating through a maze. And then this is, this is my final slide. Clinicians are an interesting type of animal. They are, by design, conservative, cautious, risk averse. And the reason for that is they take responsibility for the lives of their patients. And it's gonna be the clinicians that land up needing to use this technology. And it's technology for the most part that they don't really understand. It's not part of the medical school curriculum. It's not part of the higher, higher specialist training curriculum at the moment. And I'm, I'm certainly in conversations with people trying to change that. But we need clinicians to understand AI so that they can comfortably engage with it. The other thing about the way clinicians work, and this is what industry perhaps needs to step into, is this idea of clinical governance. The idea of putting in place mechanisms to not just demonstrate that the AI, AI works, but that in a real life setting it can be used in a way that is safe and not risk free, but at least we need to understand and mitigate the risks. A quick 30 second interruption. If you're interested in artificial intelligence and health, and I'm assuming that you are because you're watching this video, I've started an AI and health blog at AIandHealth.com. So if you're interested in either reading about AI and health or contributing to the blog as a writer, please go to AIandHealth.com. At the website, you can fill in a little form that can tell us that you'd like to get a digest of the blogs or that you'd like to contribute and write for the blog. One way or the next, join the community, get involved. This is very exciting. Thanks for watching. Let's get back into the video. 
So the kinds of risks that we're talking about, the first kind of risk is, does the AI not work and we don't know that it doesn't work, right? Because this whole process relies on a black box that we can't really interrogate. And there's lots of reasons why there might be errors in an AI prediction that are difficult to see. The one is that the training data was based on a non-representative sample of society, and now you've got an output vector that is not really optimizing population health, but is designed to, 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 to optimize the health of a particular segment of society. And that's, you can easily imagine that happening because you've got to have consent to use the data, and one can imagine that there might be systematic differences between the kinds of people that give consent and the kinds of people that don't. So you can imagine that, but these are problems that can be overcome. There's other problems that you might imagine, like for example, there may be a deliberately built-in bias that recommends one drug over another for sort of commercial reasons, and no one could ever interrogate the, the algorithm, and that might be difficult, if not impossible, to discover. You may have malicious attacks that could do the same thing. There's another kind of risk, which I think is maybe the more interesting one, and the one that we need to think about, and I, and I know my time is nearly up, so I'll be very quick. It's the risk of success. In the event that a particular company develops an AI that's very successful, there will be competing companies, and the, and, and the best, the best in, in, in the be first in class may be slightly better than the second in class, right? So there's these horse races, and let's say Google is slightly better than Watson, uh, Watson IBM, and it gets the business. Now the thing about AI is that the business equals the data, data equals oxygen for an AI, and that kind of oxygen means that it will become substantially orders of magnitude better than the second in class very quickly. Take, for example, why do we all use the Google search engine? We use it because we use it. The more we use it, the better it gets, the more we want to use it. The most searched for term in Bing is Google. Like, people land up on Bing and they're like, how do I get back to Google? This is crazy. Okay, and that's the nature of AI. The more you use something, the more data it has. Every time you click on a search result in Google, that's a data point that Google can use to make their search algorithm better. And the same will apply in healthcare. The more data the algorithm gets, the better it will be, and eventually your second in class will drop out of the race. What does that mean? It means that you'll have pseudo-monopolies emerging. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You want to reward people for innovation. The problem is with pseudo-monopolies that eventually, while in the first instance they'll be cheap because they want to get the data, eventually they'll be price setters. And that might mean that the promise of low- and middle-income countries accessing life-saving diagnostic technology might evaporate in front of us. Now, there are solutions to this. We've seen how humanity can go into a social contract with, for example, Big Pharma. Pharmaceutical companies are, you know, the way pharma works is we've got the, the, the World Trade Organization's multilateral trade agreements, in particular the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, which says to Big Pharma, look, you come up with a block-busting drug, you've got 20 years to make extraordinary profits, after which it's free game for everybody. And that's actually a system that's worked really well. We can't use the exact same model in the context of AI because it's not really IP that's giving, the, the, giving them the advantage, it's the access to data, but there may be mechanisms that we can explore. I think my time's probably up, so I'm gonna leave it at that, but um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions later and connect in with anybody that wants to you know, continue this conversation um, outside of this platform. Okay, thanks very much.